And no, uh, maybe at the bottom, there should be something that would show you to make the slides bigger. Presentation mode. Uh -huh. yeah. Excellent. Yes. Okay, sorry for the inconvenience. So I'll briefly go through the current epidemiology of uh, COVID-19 globally and in Ethiopia. And then we'll uh, directly go to the COVID-19 associated thrombosis, the epidemiology and pathophysiology. And most important, the most central part of our today's discussion, which is the COVID-19 associated venous thromboembolism. And I will focus on uh, VTE associated with COVID-19, especially in the areas where there is still controversy with regard to the prophylaxis, the type of uh, regimens we use for which patient is, and uh, probably also will be touching on uh, the duration of anticoagulation, prophylaxis, and then a few talk on uh, acute VT treatment, which uh, it appears that there is no uh, such big controversy in this area. And the other point I would like to touch on, so my presentation is the choice of anticoagulant in COVID-19 associated VT, and we'll go through a few special considerations, special population, and uh, this unique uh, clinical phenomenon of uh, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, which is linked to some of the COVID vaccines. And I'll finally leave you with uh, suggestions for clinical practice. So as we all know, since the uh, uh, beginning of this uh, global pandemic with uh, the SARS-CoV-2 in uh, December 2019 from the Wuhan state in China, now we are at a point where this virus already have uh, reached almost the whole world and uh, afflicting a total case of more than 216 million people. And uh, we are now seeing at a total global days of uh, close to 4.5 4 million people. And when we come to our country, there is uh, as uh, the last report of uh, today at uh, 12.40 GMT, the total case is more than 300. 3,000 and total days of 4,600 patients. And what's more interesting in, in the pattern of the COVID virus in our country is after we have seen some uh, two peaks back from uh, early May, June, and then in April, March and April, there was a tendency to for the virus to slightly lower down and it was uh, somewhat promising that it was uh, going back. And now we're now witnessing a third wave starting from uh, early August. And uh, there is a consecutive uh, increment of cases for the last uh, couple of days. And probably we may be heading into the third wave. <clears throat> so as you can see the graph, which is a little bit of a worrying pattern while we are still in the early mid August and then probably expected to increase. And that is also an interesting vaccine pattern. As you know, there is a discrepancy between the different parts of the world in terms of uh, vaccine coverages. We're still, we're still uh, lagging behind. We are almost uh, vaccinated less than two percent of the general population so that we can still expect a high rise in the virus in the future so it looks like uh, the virus is going to stay with us and we'll be continuing to discuss about the different aspects of uh, the COVID-19. So coming to the most important part of our my presentation which the venous thromboembolism associated with COVID as you know VT has emerged as an important complication of patients hospitalized with COVID-19. And we have seen early reports of uh, documented high rates of VT up to a range of uh, in the 60, 70%, even in some literature, so observational ones, higher incidences to persist even after the standard prophylactic anticoagulation. Reports have ranged from uh, as low as 1.1%, so high to close to 70%. So this greatly depends on the population which we're talking about, the modalities of diagnosis, like uh, the employment of active screening for lower extremity DVT, and the definition of the thrombosis itself, venous. Are we talking about a clinically relevant thrombosis or 
thrombosis wherever actively incidentally found device thrombosis if we can add all these figures the incidence rate may be higher so they have said that vt prevalence was higher in studies that have used an active screening so you can see up to 40 percent and there is a recent meta-analysis of uh, 66 studies that have shown more or less a close true nature of this incidence to be around 14 percent and with the highest incidence around 23 percent among the ICU patients. And in a randomized controlled trial conducted prior to the COVID-19 pandemic that we know the background information in non-COVID hospitalized patients, we usually tend to see hospital in hospital rates of uh, thrombosis close to 2.8 to 5.6. There are some reports up to eight, but this is a close range. So the figure we have seen is a little bit different from the previous knowledge of uh, non-medical hospitalized patients. One good thing about covid associated coagulopathy we'll see later soon is uh, over clinical bleeding is rare in those patients. Again, so we talk about thrombosis, venous thrombosis being by far the common one, but arterial thrombosis also have been recorded, especially in the early reports. And we have seen strokes to occur in 6.3% of patients. And also acute coronary syndrome, high cardiac infarction have also been reported. Yes, and devices are not also spared in this disease. So you can see any kind of uh, life-sustaining treatment as you use in patients is like CRRT, continuous uh, renal replacement treatment therapy, extracorporeal membrane, oxygenation, ECMO. There are high reports of thrombosis in these devices. Central venous catheter is inserted for intensive monitoring of these patients. IVC filters, like patients having them for previous uh, Diagnosis of VT and as a prophylaxis has been shown to be thrombosed. Coming to the pathogenesis of uh, coagulopathy in COVID-19, so the mechanism in uh, COVID-19 associated coagulopathy is uh, said to be both the virus and the host factor, mainly probably the way it is towards the host re response of uh, dysregulated uh, cytokine response. Some experts also uh, name or dub this situation as a cytokine storm syndrome. So these patients develop a dysregulated host response that result in an excessive release of many inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, including TNF alpha, interleukin 1, interleukin 6, and interleukin 8. And tissue factor, which is always uh, the attendant in the presence of inflammatory cytokines. And as we all know, a tissue factor is said to be the trigger for uh, the coagulation caskets with the extrinsic pathway. Once you have elaboration of the tissue factor from uh, monocytes from endothelial cells, it will be a definite marker that uh, coagulation is triggered. There's also endothelitis in this uh, disease or endotheliopathy, where there is a robust inflammation of the endothelium and it serves as a, an attractive point for cellular and non-cellular coagulation factors. As I have said, the host response is immense inflammatory response and accompanied with that is some elaboration of transcription and factors like hypoxia inducible transcription factor, which is a key player of uh, some inflammatory elaboration of inflammatory markers, including thrombin, and also is a mediator of uh, endothelial vascular formation and a further activation. Intrinsic SARS-CoV-2 procoagulant properties versus, versus is, uh, host inflammatory response is an area of uh, controversy, I've said, but it is an interplay. The coagulopathy is an interplay between these two factors, but the most uh, driving factor appears to be the robust inflammatory response. This picture or this figure, uh, demonstrate is what we have been saying, the pathophysiology of coagulation activation in sepsis, in the conventional sepsis, when there is a pathogen, the monocytes, when the 
tissue fat were expressed in monocytes, there will be an excessive immune response which is accompanied by elaboration of uh, various inflammatory markers. And you have all the other subsequent results of uh, excessive immune response like endothelial cell activation, inflammation, and activated platelets, and also, which we often consider as neutrophils as bystanders in thrombosis, but uh, they are not really bystanders. So they play also an important role in thrombosis formation by formation of these uh, neutrophil extracellular traps, which are histone and DNA substances that uh, activate the coagulation casket. So leading into a hyper, hypercoagulable state and an endothelial dysfunction and the clot formation, which is finally manifested in the patient with uh, thrombotic man manifestations, both micro and macro, with attendant organ failure. Okay, this is an interesting picture. Here, the autopsy specimen you see from a patient who died from a severe form of uh, COVID-19 disease. What they have shown in these autopsies are there is a severe diffuse pulmonary alveolar hemorrhage. So we often talk about thrombosis, but there is also hemorrhage. The clinically overt bleeding, as I've said, is low, but the organ specific confined to some of the organs, there is a hemorrhagic tendency. Okay, so I would like to keep this point. This is very important. We'll discuss later the implication with the anticoagulant treatment. Okay, I would like I will be briefly going through the other coagulation parameters which are affected in this uh, COVID-assisted coagulopathy. So it is already known, all the coagulation parameters are affected by COVID-19. The degree, the extent, and the, the course of the pattern of affection varies throughout the course of uh, the disease. And also some of the coagulation parameters are significantly affected compared to the others. The characteristically, COVID-19 associated coagulopathy shows an increased level of D-dimer and fibrinogen and slight rise in prothrombin time in the activated partial thromboplastin time. And in fact, you may even miss uh, if uh, the prothrombin time is reported in an INR. You may miss for most of the patients the change or the perturbation of uh, prothrombin time unless it is reported in uh, seconds because it is a minimal affection in the prothrombin time and activated partial thromboplastin time. There is mild thrombocytopenia. The dimer, as I have said, it has uh, uh, come out as the most important marker of uh, severity of disease in this uh, condition. And certain cutoff pointers have uh, shown to predict uh, mortality in these patients. So it's a very sensitive early marker of DIC, but uh, with a low specificity, as we know, and you know it is part of uh, the diagnostic criteria by the International Society of Thrombosis criteria for DIC, and it is elevated in 36% of COVID patients, and uh, early series have reported higher incidences, and higher D-dimer level is frequently encountered in critically ill patients compared to milder cases. More than 85% of COVID-19 non-survivors have D-dimer greater than 3 milligram per liter. Activated partial thromboplastin time, unlike conventional sepsis, APTT is often normal in patients with COVID-19 infection, and only 6% of patients develop prolongation of APTT. And the average duration of APTT appears to be similar in COVID-19 critically ill and non-critically ill patients with no significant correlation. Rotrombin, as I have said, is frequently elevated in the standard sepsis, bacterial sepsis, or other triggering factors in the clinical conventional DIC. And it is part of uh, the ICH, International Society of Thrombosis Diagnostic Criteria for DIC. And uh, there is a progressive prolongation with disease course. Almost half of patients with fatal disease develop market prolongation. But this can only augment uh, clinical evaluation and the clinical parameters of patient condition. Otherwise, by itself, cannot detect any change or modification of uh, treatment. And as I have said, it is a minimal affection and often not detected by an INR report. Fibrinogen as part of uh, an acute phase reactant 
the most specific test for diagnosis of DIC in the conventional setting. And it is part of the ICH criteria for diagnosis. And it is elevated in most patients with COVID-19 with a median level of 4.5. And strongly correlates with intra as I have said. It is a naked phase reactor. And there is a progressive decline is associated with mortality. Okay. So the, the, the problem with those markers is like fibrinogen. It is elevated. And once it starts to drop, <clears throat> It is really an ominous sign that the patient is uh, going to have a bad outcome. So it, it doesn't really help in terms of a decision. <clears throat> Thrombocytopenia is common in critically ill patients, you know, and is a marker, sensitive marker of DIC, and is part of also the DIC diagnostic criteria. And when we come to COVID, we have seen a range of uh, 10 to 36% of patients with COVID to have uh, thrombocytopenia. But if you consider really clinically significant thrombocytopenia, which is usually you know, the cutoff point below 100, is slightly less common. And it correlates with disease progression. And always, when you have thrombocytopenia, by far the other conditions, clinical conditions, especially in those critical ill patients should be always sought for and excluded before we consider as a direct consequence of the COVID. Just to summarize the difference between the COVID-associated coagulopathy and the sepsis-induced coagulopathy, while the majority of COVID-19 patients do not develop PIC, it was reported in 71% of fatal cases with a median time from admission to the development of DIC of four days. So this really tells you already the established DIC diagnostic criteria won't help COVID patients because once the affection in the coagulation parameters, the PT, the fibrinogen is low, platelet is mildly affected, that means you're going to miss patients who are really having bad disease but still not meeting the criteria. Once they start to meet the criteria, that is probably too little, too late. <clears throat> And development of DIC in COVID-19 patients is an ominous, let's say, we have said. Okay. So this table to summarize what I've been saying. So you can see the stark differences in terms of affection in the standard coagulation profile, let's say APTT and PT, which is maybe preserved or maybe slightly affected in COVID-19. And as you all know, sepsis induced uh, DIC will have a marked affection. And the fibrinogen is usually high. So this is, we've said, an inflammatory condition, but it could be also low. In that case, it's a really late sign. Thrombocytopenia is also minimally affected in COVID-19 as sensitive DIC. You don't see the peripheral morphologic pictures of uh, fragmented red cells. I've done a lot of uh, peripheral morphologies and uh, samples hospital from the IC patients we don't see usually they are really septic and the outcome is uh, poor, but we don't see a such standard manifestation, the common presentation of cystocytes as a sign of uh, microangiopathy. So with regard to those uh, coagulation parameters, what the experts recommend is uh, in hospitalized patients with COVID-19, there are currently insufficient data to recommend either for or against using this data to guide management decisions. In non-hospitalized patients with COVID-19, obviously, there are currently no data to support the measurement of uh, the coagulation markers like E-dimer, prothrombin time, or platelet count, fibrinogen, in an effect that we know which patients are going to have a downhill course so that they may be early admitted and early institution of intensive treatment. That, that is not the case so far. So we don't have data to decide based on those parameters. And also, we, we cannot use those uh, coagulation parameters to justify the use of uh, an active screening for VT. Okay, so going to the VT prophylaxis in patients with COVID-19, this is the core point of uh, the presentation and probably the controversy and the huge gap in terms of practice and lack of evidence. 
So we know the use of prophylactic anticoagulation has been shown through this risk of VT in acutely ill hospitalized non-COVID patients. So from our practice, from well established robust data, the use of anticoagulation, in fact, by employing some risk stratifications for hospitalized medical patients, it reduces the rate of uh, in hospital venous thromboembolism. Similarly, VT risk stratification and in-hospital pharmacology VT prophylaxis should be applicable for hospitalized COVID-19 patients. So coming to the data, the recent systematic review and meta-analysis of certified observational studies have shown venous thrombosis occurred close to 20% of patients with anticoagulation and close to 42% without anticoagulation. You see, you see, these are observational studies, but despite the use of anticoagulation, we have still uh, a far higher incidence. Atrial thrombosis occurred in 1.3 to 2.5% of patients with anticoagulation and 11.3% without. And thrombotic rates in prophylactic dose and high intensity anticoagulation Again, the articles I'm going to present, which are well, uh, well formed and randomized clinical trials. So there is a universal consensus on the need for pharmacology prophylaxis for hospitalized COVID-19 patients. So across any kind of international guidelines, you go. There is no controversy or argument with regard to using prophylaxis. The point is the dose, the intensity the duration, and uh, a little bit on uh, the choice of an anticoagulant in those patients, and which degree of severity of the disease should we individualize the doses. So the ongoing controversies that they have said on the intensity, duration of prophylaxis. And this arises from the lack of optimal thromboprophylaxis strategy for hospitalized COVID-19 patients. We don't have any validated risk assessment model for thrombosis and bleeding, unlike the medical patients, which use like the improved method, uh, the improved B-dimer incorporating methods. We have the Padua risk score for admitted medical patients. So we don't have as such uh, validated risk assessment for both risk of bleeding and thrombosis. Lack of high quality data comparing different anticoagulant intensity and the absence of better comparison of the efficacy and safety of the anticoagulant agents. And we don't have ample randomized trials to guide the duration of prophylactic anticoagulation. So the discrepancy, the big controversy is still persisting with regard to the intensity of a prophylactic anticoagulation. So whether to use a standard dose of prophylaxis or an intermediate or even in some cases, therapeutic prophylaxis. So when you talk about those intensities, we're deciding on a risk benefit balance between avoiding mortality and pulmonary embolism and the increased risk of major bleeding. So this is a trade-off. So the assumption is uh, like uh, if you use prophylactic intermediate or incrementally therapeutic doses of prophylaxis, the most important clinical endpoints that we consider are either pulmonary embolism and mortality. These are said to be significant efficacy outcomes and the safety issue is the major bleeding. So by increasing the intensity, we're assuming that there is a graded benefit in terms of reduction. That is it really, we don't have a such strong evidence so far. And also we expect the mortality to be incrementally prevented by using higher doses. And still, we don't have this data. But what we know is here the safety issue. So we know the bleeding associated with the use of anticoagulants is directly associated with the dose. So as we go from prophylactic dose to therapeutic, the risk of bleeding increases. So we are risking an already established, known, a plausible risk factor of major bleeding against an anticipated benefit in a clearly clinically impactful endpoints. 
with regard to that, the guidelines, you can, you, you can refer to lots of guidelines, but most of the leading larger ones, like including the International Society of Thrombosis, the American Society of Hematology, WHO, the CHESS, and the Anticoagulation Forum. These are by far the leading sources of opinion and guidance for anticoagulation practice generally, and also with the COVID-19 associated anticoagulation. So when you see their recommendations in different aspects of this COVID-19 associated coagulopathy, like the use of prophylactic intensity, anticoagulation, the ISH, almost all of them recommend the standard one, but the International Society of Thrombosis also recommends an intermediate dose, even including for moderate sick patients and for the severe patients. So it suggests that it can be considered to use an intermediate dose. And the anticoagulation forum also recommends intermediate dose for critically ill patients. The others seem to be in uh, agreement in terms of using the prophylactic. The ISTH recommends, actually the International Society of Thrombosis, it is an early document and it, is, it hasn't been updated since. And the expert is, it is an expert opinion. So they voted in the plot to 30, 50% of the experts favor the ease of, or suggest that can be used an intermediate dose. The options of anticoagulation, low molecular weight heparin and unfractionated heparin appears to be a consensus across the board. You can use also fandaparin next in selected patients and unfractionated heparin to the recommendation of uh, the chest. And the preferred one, again, is a low molecular weight heparin by most guidelines. The ASH reserves itself because of the lack of direct evidence. The others are more or less reliant on the already existing data from uh, non-COVID patients and also the benefit of low molecular weight heparin in the specific population with regard to health professional exposure. And the duration is another area of controversy across the uh, guidelines. So the ISTH recommends extending post-discharge prophylaxis. We'll come to that point as a separate discussion. And also the anticoagulation forum also recommends extending it without specific cutoff point. The others still confine themselves with regard to recommending anticoagulation while in hospital. The ISTH, in contrast to the other, again, it recommends a multimodal thromboprophylaxis for the ICU patient. So using both pharmacologic anticoagulation prophylaxis and using some devices like impermittent pneumatic compression. Okay. So I brought this uh, recommendation from the ASH. This is uh, on February 2021. So what it suggests is, is using prophylactic intensity over intermediate intensity or therapeutic intensity anticoagulation for patients with COVID-19 related acute illness, referring it to those patients having non-critical disease, the moderate or the others who don't have suspected or confirmed. You can see it is a conditional recommendation. So they don't strongly word their recommendations as a suggestion. And we have always to pay attention to the strength of the recommendation, which is conditional. So the conditional recommendations have implications at different levels for treating physician, for the patient, for the families, for policymakers. So it doesn't mean that we have to directly buy those recommendations. But from the best of their knowledge and the available data at this time, what they favored was using prophylactic intensity. As I have said, this weak kind of uh, recommendation comes from low certainty for benefit of therapeutic or intermediate intensity anticoagulation compared to standard intensity. Mortality benefit was very uncertain. This is from the pooled systematic review they did in the absence of uh, randomized trials. They did a systematic review meta-analysis of uh, or the existing observational studies when they make this uh, suggestion during February 2021. So there, there was no mortality benefit. It was uncertain. 
As you can see, the odds ratio is 7.73, and the confidence interval is also not significant. And major bleeding, the odds ratio, we know. This is what I've said. This is established one. We know using different intensity of anticoagulation increases the risk with an odds ratio of close to four. Okay, so they based their weak suggestion in favor of the standard prophylactic dose. And there is a lack of high quality data to decide on the benefit decreased mortality in P and the risk of major bleeding equation. No randomized trial, no systematic meta-analysis and earlier reports of benefit from observational studies, which are at high risk of bias. So what do we have after that? After probably most of those uh, international guidelines, we have some data coming out now. So this is uh, one of uh, the trials that was published on uh, JAMA and is an effect of intermediate dose versus standard dose prophylactic anticoagulation on thrombotic events, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation treatment or mortality among patients with COVID-19 admitted to the intensive care unit. Now this, is, this was named as Inspiration Randomized Clinical Trial. The design is a multicentral randomized trial and trial population patients with COVID-19 admitted to the ICU. <clears throat> And the intervention was intermediate dose in Oxapoli, one milligram per kg once daily, and uh, standard prophylactic anticoagulation in Oxapoli, 40 milligram daily. The sample size was uh, 600 and 562 were included in the primary analysis. Here is an attractive primary efficacy outcome, which is a composite of venous or arterial thrombosis treatment with ICMO or mortality within 30 days. So these are really a clean and very important clinical outcomes than using some other uh, respiratory support or mechanical ventilation parameters in terms of improvement. So they have used very important clinical outcomes. In the pre-specified safety outcomes, major bleeding and severe thrombocytopenia was taken. And the result? Primary efficacy outcome, the composite in the point of requirement of advanced support to mortality was seen in 126 patients, almost the same, exactly the same number in both groups. So <clears throat> showing no significant difference. And the major bleeding was also insignificant. Okay, so this is a graph from this presentation, as you can see, the follow-up period is around 30 days. And the standard dose in oxaparin compared to intermediate dose in oxaparin. So as you go through the course of follow-up, the slight separation in the graphs again comes back closer. So it doesn't seem to have any subsequent benefit. So it is really twin graphs you are seeing here. And they concluded among patients is admitted to the ICU with the COVID-19 intermediate dose prophylactic anticoagulation compared with standard dose prophylactic anticoagulation didn't result in a significant difference in the primary outcome of composite of adjudicated venous or arterial thrombosis treatment with ICMO or mortality within 30 days. And here is one fascinating global uh, collaboration. It's a big platform involving uh, including around five of the continents and most uh, countries from Europe and North America, they have formed a, a collaborative platform. In fact, those trials are not confined to COVID-19 or anticoagulation only. There are arms of studies in those collaborative platform to assess the roles of uh, statins, uh, the antiplatelets, different antiplatelet agents, and in fact, the anticoagulants. So they did a collaborative, it is an ongoing trial. Some of the data have come out. As I have said, the ASH made the recommendation prior to the publication of those results. In fact, immediately the preliminary data came and now we have a peer reviewed version of those data. So they are planning to revise the previous recommendation you have seen the suggested standard dose prophylaxis after the publication of this uh, larger data. So this is one of them that came from this collaborative effort. 
and this is therapeutic anticoagulation with heparin in critically ill patients with COVID-19. Actually, it came the day before, but it was already published as a preliminary data. So it was not peer reviewed earlier. Now we have it uh, on the England Journal. The hypothesis is therapeutic dose anticoagulation would improve outcomes in critically ill patients with COVID-19. We know the pathophysiology, the thrombotic state, micro and macro thrombosis is said to be the leading cause of morbidity and mortality. And especially the respiratory failure is uh, considered to be acidic. So using higher doses of anticoagulation should lead to an improved outcome. That's the hypothesis. An open-level randomized control trial was designed and it was an adaptive multi-platform. And uh, by adaptive, they have just given some degree of freedom to the treating physicians in the participating centers to use their standard prophylactic regimens. Whatever they call is a standard dose or intermediate dose was not strictly monitored. And also exclusion criteria as well not stringent other than the requirement for uh, therapeutic doses of anticoagulation during admission or high risk of bleeding. Okay. So it was more or less, uh, it, it replicates the real world practice. And I like that kind of approach for specifically for such kind of uh, uh, urgent clinical public health problem. And the trial population, critically ill COVID-19 patients, and uh, the intervention was therapeutic versus usual care pharmacology thromboflaxis with either low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin. The primary outcomes in hospital mortality and days free of organ support until day 21 of the follow-up. So the organ support is defined as a requirement of any respiratory or cardiovascular support in terms of uh, including the requirement for high flow nasal cannula or mechanical ventilation, be it invasive or non-invasive, or the requirement of uh, CV support with inotropes or vasopressor. So we have close to 1,100 patients, and uh, they are critically ill patients with severe disease, and they were assigned to receive therapeutic doses of anticoagulation and uh, the usual care thromboprophylaxis. So the median organ support free day was one, and with an interquartile range of minus one to 16 among patients assigned to the therapeutic anticoagulation. And it was four days for this usual care thromboprophylaxis with the same interquartile range. And uh, just zero three, and as you can see, it crosses also one, which doesn't appear to be significant. And the percentage of patients who survived to hospital discharge was similar in the two groups, 62 and 64%. Major bleeding occurred in 3.8% of patients assigned to therapeutic dose anticoagulation and 2.3% of those assigned to the usual care pharmacology prophylaxis. So you can see with no observed benefit in terms of the primary endpoints with a risk of increased major bleeding. And they concluded that in critically ill patients with COVID-19, an initial strategy of uh, therapeutic dose anticoagulation with heparin didn't result in a greater probability of survival to hospital discharge or a greater number of days free of cardiovascular or respiratory organ support and did the usual care pharmacologic thromboprophylaxis. The other wing within this collaborative platform was to try this uh, therapeutic anticoagulation for patients who are non-critically ill or are not in the ICU. So this was parallel, this study was started actually, this started was terminated before the full accrual of patients because of it met the criteria of fertility that the harm was seen in those patients and that there is no superiority. In fact, before the harm, they have proved with a predefined criteria that it was not superior and there is a tendency towards harm with use of therapy. And similar fate was also faced by this study in non-critical ill patients. And actually this was 
suspended because there was a benefit in and critically ill patients. Okay, so this is again the same hypothesis, but in non critically ill patients, an open level and adapting multi platform, maybe wondering the design to be both open level randomized control trial, but it doesn't appear to be significant in terms of uh, the primary endpoints. As you can see, the primary endpoints are like in hospital mortality and days free of organ support. So they are really less likely to be biased in terms of ascertainment of outcome. And then adapt adaptive plat platform. And these are trial population, as I have said, non critically ill COVID 19 patients, which was defined as an absence of critical care level organ support at enrollment. So, requiring any advanced critical care is not just a mere admission to the ICU. Okay? Like if you admit one of your best friend or families to the ICU for a close follow up, doesn't mean it qualifies for an ICU admission or a uh, you know, critical illness. So these are patients again, non-critically ill and not requiring advanced organ support. And the intervention is ther therapeutic versus usual care, pharmacologic thromboprophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin. In both the studies, the majority of patients took low molecular weight heparin, more than 90% of the patients. And the primary outcome was in hospital mortality and days free of organ support to day to anyone and evaluated according to baseline e dimer level. So they have added some qualifying pre-specified analysis for the primary outcome. So based on a d dimer level, cutoff point greater than or less than two above the upper limit of normal. So they have tried to see the benefit in those groups also. They have included more than 2,200 patients and the probability that therapeutic dose anticoagulation increased organ support three days as compared with usual care thromboprophylaxis was 98.6%. Adjusted odds ratio 1.27. It appears a significant one. And the adjusted absolute between group difference in the survival until hospital discharge without organ support favoring therapeutic dose anticoagulation was 4%. A little bit short of uh, significance. And the final probability of uh, superiority of therapeutic dose anticoagulation over usual care thromboprophylaxis was 97% in the high D-dimer, the pre-specified subgroups, and 93% in the low D-dimer. And that means across different levels, it appears to be beneficial. And major bleeding occurred in 1.9% versus 0.9% of uh, those patients receiving prophylactic doses. Again, they conclude from this uh, finding, non-critically ill patients with COVID-19, an initial strategy of therapeutic dose anticoagulation with heparin increased the probability of several survival to hospital discharge with reduced ease of cardiovascular or respiratory organ support as compared with usual care. So these are uh, they have said a uh, large data and well organized and high quality uh, data is coming from randomized clinical trials, more or less representing different uh, large parts of uh, the world. Though there is a difference between uh, the two, the first in the critically ill patients, the majority of uh, the patients were recruited from one of the wing, the REMAP CAP, which is in UK, and the non critically ill, which I have presented now. Most of the patients were recruited from US. So in both the two wings of the trial, there are patients from the US. So you, you can still ask whether there is a clear similarity between those patients. In fact, uh, patients from Brazil were also included in this. And finally, those uh, authors from both literature have concluded for both the critically and non-critically ill patient to say use of therapeutic Dose of heparin, as compared with the usual care venous thromboprophylaxis, increased the probability of surviving a hospital discharge with fewer days of cardiovascular or respiratory support in patients with moderate COVID, but not in those with severe COVID-19. Okay. 
So this is just a table to show you some of the regimens as considered as a prophylactic dose and intermediate dose. So in oxaparin, in fact, always we have to adjust the dose for obese patient, patients with a body mass index of uh, greater than 40. And if you have renal failure, you need to adjust for the inoxaparin. Otherwise, these are the standard one. By far common in our setup, what we use is unfractionated heparin. So the standard prophylactic, what we say is um, either 5,000 unit BID or 7,500 unit BID. Again, here there is a significant, because 7,500 unit subcutaneous TID is said to be an intermediate one. And in the standard one, these are similar. Several studies have shown whether you use 5,000 subcutaneous BID or 7,500 BID, they have the same efficacy. And also there is increased risk of bleeding with using higher risk, higher dose of heparin. And also it was suggested for resource limited setups. And in fact, in sample, we've tried to adopt the 5,000 BID. And it's a significant one. If you just calculate the doses per 24 hour, you may save a, a dose for a patient. So it has a resource implication. So advise also to use in the routine practice of 5,000 circuit in SBID. Coming to the second point of controversy with regard to prophylaxis is the duration. How long do we anticoagulate patients once they are admitted for COVID-19? <clears throat> So there is no direct evidence to suggest for extended or post-discharge VT prophylaxis in hospitalized COVID-19 patients. The recommendation by SCH, anticoagulation forum and others for extended prophylaxis, which I have shown in the table, is derived from the indirect evidence that showed the benefit of post-discharge thromboprophylaxis in non-COVID-19 hospitalized medical patients. In fact, this extended post-discharge Prophylaxis hasn't come as a universal practice yet all over the world. We know that the risk of thrombosis once a patient is hospitalized, be it from COVID or non-COVID medical illness, hospitalized with severe illness, the risk of thrombosis of procoagulant state from the sedentary stay from the disease activity will not usually shut off or will be switched off when the patient is sent home during the discharge day. It persists around four to six weeks post the discharge. And in fact, data are very clear with regard to hospital associated venous thromboembolism. Close to 60% of the cases occur in the early post discharge period, usually the first three weeks, but it extends up to six weeks. We know that, but we don't have still well-established risk stratification to whom we should give an extended anticoagulation for medical patients. So in the presence of such kind of ambiguity, and there are some risk stratification scoring methods, including using the improved method and addition of a D-dimer certain cutoff points to see the high risk patients and uh, prescribe them with prophylaxis during discharge, hasn't been again, as I have said, a standard practice. But those guidelines are recommending extending it to using over 19 patients. At least what we have so far, observational data is one interesting data here I'm presenting. It is a comparative study with a retrospective historical data of uh, post-medical discharge VT events, one center, and uh, they followed patients after COVID-19 discharge. So 1,800 patients, and this is a historical data from quality control of uh, the hospital. So this is a hospital associated VT at day 42, nine cases out of 1,856 out of uh, these discharges in the previous year. And the rate of post-discharge hospital associated VT was 4.8 per 1,000, here 3.8 per 1,000 with the background incidence in medical patients. You see the odds ratio at discharge for VT, for COVID patients is 1.6. Again, it appears to be non-significant. At least from this observational data, what we can see is still, it is a reassuring that we can still persist with the practice of using prophylaxis until discharge. 
So any decision to use post-discharge VT prophylaxis for patients with COVID-19 should include consideration of the individual patient's risk factors for VT, including reduced mobility, bleeding risk, and feasibility, and patients who are on anticoagulant treatment for an underlying medical condition should continue anticoagulation post-discharge. Okay. Otherwise, extending it at the universal practice upon discharge is not helpful and it is also a big strain in terms of uh, healthcare costs. In the absence of an indication, anticoagulation prophylaxis for hospitalized COVID-19 patients should be limited until discharge. So this is in uh, accordance with uh, most of the recommendations. With regard to an incident, uh, acute venous thromboembolism, in COVID-19 patients, it is almost the same with uh, conventional consensus guidelines. There is no acid discrepancy. So con confirm it, we, we use therapeutic anticoagulation for covid assisted VTs for confirmed patients, either the VTRP when diagnostic imaging is not possible. Patients with COVID-19 or highly suspected to have thromboembolic disease should be managed with therapeutic dose of anticoagulant therapy. So when we say highly suspected, it's not just a merely subjective um, gut feeling, but we have to use indirect methods, like a patient who is suddenly deteriorating in terms of his uh, respiratory status or sudden increment in the requirement of oxygen. And uh, if you have, for certain reasons, uh, catheters, central catheters inserted, increment of uh, pulmonary artery pressure, or if you use, uh, ECG's signs of a right heart strain pattern, or if you use a bedside echocardiography showing similar pattern and uh, an elevated pulmonary pressure. And if you use also bedside ultrasound for lower extremity DVT, and the patient is also suspected to have a P and uh, the finding detection of DVT will uh, shift the patient into a therapy. Dose. So low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin are recommended over the direct oral anticoagulant in the initial phase of treatment. Okay, this is one salient uh, difference. Unlike uh, now already the approved direct oral anticoagulants, which we can use upfront for acute VT, in case of COVID-19, which is a rapidly evolving a dynamic disease process, and uh, we don't know how much how they will react to the direct oral anticoagulants and the uh, experience and knowledge and the requirement of intensive interventions during the course will favor the use of those uh, parenteral agents, at least in the initial first seven days and you're sure the patient is not having a downhill course. So progressive improvement, you may consider switching. In the absence of contraindication, low molecular weight heparin is preferred over unfractionated heparin. This is again, in keeping with the known recommendation for other VT patients. And recommendations for treatment and monitoring of acute VT associated with COVID-19 should follow the standard recommendations in non-COVID-19 patients. So anticoagulation treatment, once we have an incident VT and treated at least a minimum of three months should be employed in those patients and reassessment for risk of bleeding and an ongoing risk of VT recurrence. So for the anticoagulant selections, we have already mentioned some preferences to have the low molecular weight heparin. Generally, the heparins are preferred and low molecular weight heparin over unfractionated heparin. So because both the heparins have a short half lives and it has an implication in those patients, you may need to insert some devices, invasive procedures with rapidly deteriorating condition. And they have fewer drug-drug interactions. Probably in our setup may not be a big issue, but in settings where there are a lot of uh, trial drugs and there is a potential for drug-drug interaction, so those heparins have a minimal interaction and high baseline risk of bleeding in critically ill patients. Okay. So we have to use agents with uh, short half lives and uh, known well-established reversal agents in case of uh, bleeding. 
and routine availability of uh, reversal agent and parenteral administration, IV and subcutaneous. This is uh, another advantage in those population of patients because most of the sick patients are not able to take uh, pure medication. So more with the heparins, as you know, there are some additional effects of uh, heparins, like an anti-inflammatory effect, the neutralization of uh, the cytokine, chemokine, and extracellular histones. It is known that they have some effect other than inflammatory agent, but they haven't been tried as for the sole reason of an anti-inflammatory agent for COVID-19, but they have an added benefit of uh, this property and reduced SARS-CoV-2 cellular entry by competitive binding to the heparin, heparin sulfate on the host cell membrane. This has been clearly demonstrated in laboratory data that uh, the heparins, especially the unfractionated heparin, prevent the virus from entry into target cells. So it may be a tip. Low molecular over unfractionated heparin, because as we know, the low molecular weight heparin obviates the need for routine monitoring. And once daily administration, it decreases uh, exposure and requirement of higher than usual dose of unfractionated heparin has been also seen in those patients. So even uh, mandating the use of uh, alternative monitoring parameters like anti-factor 10 A level should be done, which is not available in our setup. So you cannot simply use APTT in some of the patients because of high cytokines inflammatory markers interfering and there is uh, what seems like a heparin resistance in those patients. In the post-hospital discharge, you can use DOAX, including Rivaroxaban, Apixaban, provide advantages over vitamin K antagonists such as warfarin due to the lack of need for routine monitoring and subsequent minimization of patient contact with healthcare pro environment. So once patients are discharged, they may not want to come back to the clinics for some obvious reasons. So you may give them option. And the drugs like Rimbaroxaban, Apixaban, Ituaxaban, and Davigatran can be used for extended treatment of VT on discharge from hospital. So coming to the special consideration, the pregnant ladies, there are just few things to consider, like the antithrombotic therapy is prescribed during pregnancy prior to a diagnosis of COVID-19. They should maintain that. And uh, for pregnant patients hospitalized for severe COVID-19, prophylactic dose anticoagulation is recommended. So we don't have any peculiarity considering that they are pregnant and we know it is a procoagulant state. So that's not the case. So we continue to we'll stick with the data with standard prophylaxis. Like for non-pregnant patients, VT prophylaxis after hospital discharge is not recommended for pregnant patients. Okay. So considering they are more again having a pregnancy, a procoagulant state, you can consider for some of the patients, but still there is no recommendation to do that. Unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin, and warfarin do not accumulate in the breast milk and do not induce an anticoagulant. This is established fact. And the direct acting oral anticoagulants during pregnancy are not recommended due to lack of safety data. What about patients already on an anticoagulant or antiplatelets? Okay, so patients who are receiving warfarin and who are in isolation and thus unable to have. Uh, INR monitoring, maybe candidates for switching to drugs, but these are, mind you, these are just a stable patients in isolation. And patients receiving warfarin who have a mechanical heart valve, ventricular assist device, valvular atrial fibrillation or antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, or who are lactating should continue treatment with warfarin. So these are strong recommendations to still maintain the warfarin because we don't have data with a direct oral anticoagulant to use in this clinical scenarios. In fact, we have uh, data of uh, terrible failure of um, the drugs compared to warfarin in patients with antiphospholipid syndrome. So higher incidences of uh, recurrent VT have been shown in some trials leading to termination. So we should maintain warfarin in those patients. And hospitalized patients with COVID-19 
or taking anticoagulant or antiplatelet therapy for underlying medical condition should continue this treatment unless significant bleeding develops or other contraindication. So as I have said, there is some uh, unique disease condition we has witnessed early and probably there are few cases coming out after the introduction of this uh, COVID-19 vaccines. Some uh, atypical thrombotic event was observed, like the initial reports of 13 cases, which are 12 women and one man of sinus cerebral vein thrombosis, after 1.6 million doses of AstraZeneca COVID vaccine, and their age range of uh, 20 to 63. And the thrombosis had occurred four to 16 days after vaccination. And the patient has also had thrombocytopenia with almost universal. Thrombocytopenia is almost universal. The degree may vary, but they have thrombocytopenia. And it is a sign that there is a thrombosis and thrombocytopenia, you're dealing with some immune-mediated process. And no information to date on any increased risk for the thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome in patients with blood disease and or pre-existing risk factors for thrombosis. So there is not such an increased tendency in those patients. As you can see, the age range is uh, young and there is some preponderance towards women. And the updated incidence from CDC review recently was uh, two per million for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine based on a total of 15 cases reported following 7.98 million doses of administered vaccine. And the AstraZeneca reported from the UK of has an, a rough incidence. Okay, so it's just a, a pro data, early data, like 20 patients per million doses and uh, in those age of uh, 18 to 49 years compared to slightly lower. Again, you see some tendency towards uh, younger patients. So vaccination is likely to induce this condition, TTS, to induce the formation of antibodies against uh, platelet, anti-platelet factor four. And uh, once you have patients with compatible clinical uh, evidences having been received, uh, the vaccine, and then manifesting with atypical symptoms, the thrombosis is not confined, though the early reports are in the cerebral circulations, but it can have a typical site as abdominal or even the conventional sites of thrombosis. So coming with symptoms of thrombosis with respective symptoms and having ex being exposed to a vaccine is good to consider and also if you're available, sending for some of this confirmatory tests using the ELISA HIT assay and uh, screening test, and they can confirm with those functional assays like the HIPAA, heparin induced platelet activation or serotonin release assay. These are both not routinely available even in the best setups, but they are usually done in referral laboratories. So confining this problem, suspecting and diagnosing will be merely or solely dependent on uh, clinical suspicion. What I've come up recently with a uh, Proposed diagnostic criteria with some uh, five criteria, and uh, definitive diagnosis should meet those criteria. So, COVID vaccine, so they have extended the duration for to 42 days prior to symptom onset. Any venous or arterial thrombosis, in fact, arterial thrombosis have also been reported, often cerebral and abdominal thrombocytopenia, platelet count less than 150, or positive platelet factor for heat antibodies by ELISA test and markedly elevated D-dimer. As I have said, thrombocytopenia and markedly elevated D-dimer is said to be uh, a hallmark or it, it persists in most of the patients. The treatment is uh, you just uh, have to give them, considering this is an immune-mediated condition, you give them high dose IVIG, and also if there is a confirmed thrombosis, you have to use non heparin anticoagulant. As you can see, it is pretty much a kind hip, like uh, immune-mediated thrombotic phenomenon, like heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, both the elaboration of the antibody, the thrombotic manifestation. So this is uh, some cousin disease with a uh, hit. And the other recommendation is to avoid 
platelet transfusion in those patients for an anticipated increased risk of uh, thrombosis in those patients, unless you have a compelling indication. So at the high stage, as uh, given a recommendation is that all eligible adults continue to receive their COVID-19 vaccination. Because following those reports of atypical site thrombosis after vaccination have caused a lot of uh, media uh, havocs and uh, people tend to avoid that. But it was a brief and after seeing that the incidence is not that much increased, though there is a cause effect association with uh, clearly documented antibody demonstrations, it, the risk benefit is said to be in the favor of uh, using the vaccine. So the ISH recommends and a small number of reported thrombotic events relative to the millions of administered COVID-19 vaccine doesn't suggest a direct link. In fact, there is antibody demonstration, looks like time temporal association, seems like a cause effect association, but still it is not a reason to hold oneself from getting the vaccine. And the benefits of COVID-19 vaccination strongly outweigh, I've said. So what we advise for patients, the most important thing, probably the other clinically important uh, questions you will face are those patients having already diagnosed VTE, taking an anticoagulant, and they often come to the clinic always asking whether they should go for the vaccine or not. So the answer is they should get, whether they have a, a VTE, whether they are on anticoagulant, whether they have in the past VTEs, it is not contraindication. So they have to get it. If they are getting anticoagulants, if they are on treatment, therapeutic doses of whatever, DOAC or warfarin, what we need to advise is they have to be vaccinated prior to the next dose of anticoagulation, should be considered, and there is a risk of breathing at the injection site. So you may prolong the pressure at the site. So unlike the other people, they may need to inspect the site and they may need to apply for longer duration pressure to avoid bruising and bleeding. And patients, if they are on warfarin, if it is possible, and they have supratherapeutic and INR, should wait until their INR is less than four. So this is a common uh, encounter in the clinics. So you may need to, especially those patients having difficult INRs, they may need to check, and if they have a supratherapeutic one, they may need to wait until it comes below four. Okay. So having said all the data, the controversy is still, and uh, the clinical practice is one of the challenging thing, which I have seen in some of the centers I have presented this uh, in uh, this, where treating physicians are having a tough time in terms of deciding the dose and intensity of anticoagulation in the absence of a decisive clinical guideline, be it from international uh, documents or even local one. So we have a national guideline here, third edition. And uh, what it says is uh, anticoagulation for VT, moderate to severe cases who are admitted to the general ward requires prophylactic anticoagulation and the duration of anticoagulation depends on the patient's condition. In general, our recommendation is 14 days for moderate cases and 42 days for severe cases. Low molecular weight heparin is generally preferred than high molecular weight heparin, except in patients with uh, in the stage renal failure and patients who need invasive procedure. There is a dose. For critical patients requiring therapeutic anticoagulation, inoxaparin, subcutaneous BID, and then I'm fractionated the paracetamol bolus and some therapeutic doses with some specific duration. So this is my new prophylaxis. So as I've said there is a gap in evidence throughout the world, and when it comes to our local guidelines, they're a bit out of uh, the evolving, rapidly evolving data. So they are not really helpful in terms of. Uh, guiding the clinical practice. How do we adapt? What do we do? Or in the face of like uh, rapidly emerging evidences, lack of high quality evidence to inform daily practice, weak or conditional recommendations in favor of or against interventions, okay? 
And as I have said, these are not the recommendations to buy. If they are conditional ones. You need to consider a lot of factors, local context, availability, cost, and all the burden on the health care. So we should, our practice should be informed based on adhering to recommendations of professional societies and local standards policies available. We have protocol guidelines for most of our clinical decisions should stick with those recommendations for many reasons, including that's probably the best evidence you can get. That doesn't mean there is no room for individualization based on each and every patient we encounter, but still we inform our decision based on the status. And also it spares us from some medical legal issues because we cannot just treat patients out of pocket suggestions. So we have to stick with whatever recommendation is available. If you have local policies, we have to refer to that. But unfortunately, they're not helpful in our case. And staying updated with emerging new evidences. That's another way out of this uh, problem and consideration of local resources, availability, cost, and familiarity of interventions, availability of monitoring and reversal agents. Values and preference of patients as caretakers, shared decision should be made. So as I have said, the conventional, less strong recommendations from those guidelines means you have a room to discuss with the patient, tell as much information the patient can comprehend, and make the decision mutually. So it's a shared decision. And also it has an implication for policymakers. Taking such kind of recommendations directly adopting may not be beneficial or maybe cost prohibitive. So with that, again, as I have said, most of the guidelines are not really, if you closely see, they don't call, they don't dare to call themselves as guidelines in this time because of lack of high quality data, either they are expert opinions, they are guidances, okay? So they don't call themselves as guidelines, okay? And the other point now, we are, what we have learned from COVID is there is a rapidly emerging, as I have shown you, some of those uh, peer reviewed articles came after most of the publication of the uh, well, famous guidelines, international, well, strong guidelines, but still where they are lacking in terms of updating. So they have come up recently with the concept of uh, living guidance or living guideline. What it meant is, what it means is, uh, as you know, in clinical practice, studies come every time, but the guidelines, the standard textbooks we use, they have a pre-specified updating time. So while things are changing, while there is an ample evidence, we stick on the standard recommendations. So it's such kind of uh, traditional practice has been challenged with COVID-19. It is a rapidly evolving disease, it's a pandemic, but at the same time, evidences for treating this uh, disease are also coming out at a pandemic rate. So we need to adapt to that. So they have come up with a living guidance. So every time, there is a reliable data, randomized, high quality data comes, comes out. They make meeting, they discuss the data and they make a focused update of that specific point. So there are, you may see in the literature, those are living guidelines. Okay? So there is this good lesson that we have to take. And finally, my living suggestion for our setting will be to use a standard dose prophylactic anticoagulation should be used for all hospitalized COVID-19 patients, or, or ICU, means critical or moderately ill patients. Low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin should be the anticoagulants of choice for VT prophylaxis. And low molecular weight heparin, inoxaparin, should be the preferred anticoagulation in most patients without renal failure or an issue of availability. I know this is not routinely available, especially in the public hospitals, but we have to work towards uh, securing this uh, noxaparin, not only for COVID, but even for the routine clinical practice prophylaxis. It is advantage 
and there is less risk of uh, heparin in this thrombocytopenia. It should be uh, one of the commonest agents we use for this purpose. And anticoagulant prophylaxis should be used for the duration of hospital stay. And low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin should be used for the treatment of acute VT in those COVID-19 patients. At least the first seven days, there is no way to use those agents. And the DOAX, Ivaroxaban, and Warfarin can be used in the extended treatment of acute VT. So with regard to that, as I have said initially, I have seen you know, a huge gap in terms of practice. And I, uh, I acknowledge that there is gap in uh, evidence, but even the rat centers, which are using out of desperate action, when you are being facing a patient with COVID-19 sudden deterioration and you consider this as a, a thrombotic event, some centers have also used double the dose of therapeutic dose of anticoagulation, which I see is a, a bit problematic and it may be harmful. As I have said, those uh, autopsies of lung, those fatal cases have shown pulmonary hemorrhage. So the final respiratory failure might have to do with alveolar hemorrhage. And by adding high doses may be harmful. Probably that's what also we have seen in the randomized trial of critical ill patients with therapeutic dose. While they're not benefiting, the moderate disease, okay, so intuitively it appears also, it sounds that if there is any procoagulant state that progressively worsens with the disease state, if the patient has to draw any benefit from incremental dose, it should come early in the course of the patient's condition. So considering that, these uh, desperate measures of uh, going beyond the recommended doses are, should be strictly avoided. <clears throat> so this is uh, all I have to say, and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Afor, for the excellent talk. Uh, this has been remarkable. You covered from uh, the pathogenesis, the uh, prophylaxis treatment, and the uh, whole spectrum of venous thromboembolism events in COVID-19. I think my, the participants have been expressing their appreciation during the talk as well. I was, was going through the message and um, just as a reminder for everyone here, if you miss part of the talk, we've been recording this webinar and um, we'll uh, upload it in our CME channel on uh, our YouTube channel so you can see. You have a lot to learn from this talk. So I again thank Dr. Afor. And there, there were some questions during the um, presentation. So most of them have been already answered during the talk. I think some of you asked before some of the slides were presented, but if Dr. Afok, you can see them under the chat section. You know, there's a lot of uh, questions that, that came during the discussion. The first one was, um, uh, if you can see, it was from Josef Alamayo. Uh, he was asking, what would you like to recommend to treat heparin-induced thrombocytopenia in COVID-19 patients? So let me take the first question, which is, uh, I think, is, the is it the first? Sorry. Can I get back? Yeah. Oh, you mean the, 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 the issue of uh, therapeutic dose in uh, non critically ill patients. Okay. Maybe actually, I have, have typed it, but I should have emphasized on that because one of the literature I've presented in those non critically ill patients. And appear to have some benefit in terms of some of the clinical endpoints, the requirement of uh, organ support or even mortality. But for changing a practice, as I have said, this is a single data. And uh, even the authors finally didn't suggest the change of practice. And most of the literature, the guidances, didn't take this as a final verdict in terms of uh, going for therapeutic dose of. Uh, anticoagulation for moderately ill patients. As I have said, it sounds probably it is the right time to use at early course of the diseases than in a patient who is on a mechanical ventilation, a terminal ill patient probably will do more harm by aggravating the localized pulmonary hemorrhage. And there is an early data, there is a benefit. 
but to come up with a standard practice so that we can use for all moderate, mind you, if we are using for moderate patients, you can imagine how much will be the attending costs with that. Also, adoption of a routine clinical practice following a single randomized trial may not be a good thing to do. So I still would be waiting probably more literature to come up and preferably also the other standard evaluation methods because the guidelines don't simply pick up a randomized trial results and adopt, but they go through different evidence to decision-making uh, modeling, consideration of local context, even their recommendation may not be directly re reproducible to our setup. So considering all these things being a single result, probably may change in the future, but it is wise still to wait with the standard prophylaxis, even for the moderate patients. Yeah, thank you very much. This is a very critical question. Thank you. Uh, if you can see under the, there uh, to attend this or uh, the participants, please, you can use a Q&A section to type your questions. I have seen a lot of questions under the chat section, but um, the um, there was a question. I'm going to go all the way up and uh, would you like to recommend uh, how to treat heparin-induced thrombocytopenia in COVID-19 patients. I don't know how common that is. But... Okay, heparin-induced uh, thrombocytopenia, another very problematic condition. It is often overcalled because we use heparin for most patients admitted, and thrombocytopenia is by far common in critical illness, be it COVID or non-COVID. So always um, the message for thrombocytopenia in most of the hospitalized patients cause of thrombocytopenia, more than 90% of the cases are not related with the heparin they are taking. It is either from the disease itself, from infection, from drugs, or other laboratory causes. So always we have to give attention to exclude. So this is for the background heat consideration. And the other problem with heat is once we suspect heat, there is no confirmatory test in our setup. In fact, even in the best setup, they only have the screening ELISA test for an antiplatelet factor for antibody, which can be present for whatever reason in an admitted patient from the medical illness, post-surgery, or even during pregnancy. So that screening test doesn't mean final thing. We need a confirmatory test. And as I've said, those tests are not routinely available, okay? So once we consider, we ended up being locked into a difficult choice because we are going to stop a life-saving intervention, the heparin at hand we have. Okay? So the best instrument is to use the 40 scoring and to score them very strictly, probably more conservatively than putting the points there because we strictly need the day of onset of thrombocytopenia should be recorded daily. That's not the case. We don't do CVCs every day, but we end up overestimating the 40 square. So we have to be very stringent in making that. And once we have a properly scored 40 score and it is high likely be the COVID or non-COVID patient, if it is high likely and there is also worsening of thrombosis or a new thrombosis and it is high likely score, we need to stop. We need to stop. You know, the, the fourth problem again comes once we have stopped, the standard recommended non-heparin anticoagulants are not available. So considering it, putting a, or a differential on top for every patient on whatever exposure of heparin in developing thrombocytopenia may not be a wise thing, but once we did all our best and it is a very likely, high likelihood, we stopped the heparin and we have an option, which is now actually not FDA approved, but Rivaroxaban, one of the direct oral anticoagulants can be used. We have used it for a couple of patients, but we, we I don't know whether these patients were really hit or not because we never had ELISA or even the confirmatory tests, but with 40 scoring system, they appears to be high likely disease. So we discontinued the heparin and with rivaroxaban and similar experiences have come from different uh, areas. So from different countries. So rivaroxaban can be used in this case. Again, when it is a COVID patient, we need to consider the drug-drug interaction if he's getting any any intervention drugs, 
And if a patient is on really severe disease with mechanical ventilation, invasive procedures using those, the only non-FDA approved but locally available rivaroxaban would be again another headache. So I, I, I cannot directly suggest, but most of the cases of suspected heat, be it with a COVID or non-COVID patients, should be resolved before discontinuing the life threatening heparin. And once we commit ourselves, based on the patient scenario, we can use rivaroxaban. That's all I can say. Thank you. That was an excellent answer. Um, there's another question from Abdullah Mulgeta. Uh, he was asking about what is the incidence of venous thrombosis events or phenomena once the patient's completely recovered and discharged as compared to the COVID patients? I think it's post-discharge or post-acute phase of the COVID, we still see the uh, uh, thromboembolic events still. That's what I understood from the question. Yeah, probably. And I don't have uh, local data, unfortunately. We're still trying to gather even for the uh, admitted COVID patients for incidences of BT. But post-discharge, as I have shown you one of the observational data, it appears not to be different from a medically recently admitted patients. So we expect, like any other critical illness, recently admitted patients, those COVID-19 patients to have still a persistent risk factor, but extending of uh, prophylaxis as I've already presented is not recommended, but we can still individualize. If there are additional conventional risk factors from immobility or obesity, previous history of uh, VTE, and now being discharged from a recent admission from the hospital, you can consider, and these are actually, or the presence of uh, VT in the past, malignancies or family history or a known thrombophilic status, which are now being organized as into a risk stratification model. And some of them also have used the D-dimer liver at discharge, which is a somewhat a modification of the improved uh, scoring system. So we can at least individualize and consider for each patient but in terms of incidences, I haven't come up with uh, a local or any international figure rather than the, what I have already presented. Thank you. Um, another question from uh, Dr. Bistrat Hussein. Uh, he was thankful for your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Apple, for your excellent and relevant presentation. Is there any data regarding the use of the novel oral anticoagulant agents in either treatment and prophylaxis of BT and COVID? I think you may have addressed some of it during the presentation, but to be sure, we can discuss it. Yeah, so the, the data, most of the data have come with the new oral anticoagulants are usually for those uh, patients either in isolation or those patients were considered as uh, to be discharged based on their clinical condition within 72 hours of admission. So practically these are not the patients which are problematic for our practice. So in those cases, they have used, that means practically, these are more or less patients like uh, the other VT or COVID severe patients diagnosed with thrombosis, treated with the parenteral agents. And once they are ready to go home, as they have presented, they have been given the drugs in the treatment. There are ongoing trials using for mild cases, even as an outpatient with low doses of uh, those direct oral anticoagulants for prophylaxis, or even for preventing disease deterioration, which I know are these are ongoing trials. I haven't come up with uh, any data as of outcome with treatment. Okay. Uh, another very good question, Dr. Gzachaltaye. Thank you, doctor, for the informative points. My question is, uh, what advice to give uh, about COVID vaccine for those who already have or been diagnosed with VTE like DVT. Okay. So probably I've touched it. Okay, in this yeah. point, the, the ISTH, well, it is very important. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that it was raised again because it's a very common one. We have a lot of VTE patients on treatment, some of them even in the acute phases. So they come up to whatever nearby treating physician asking for, even after taking your advice, they still uh, hesitate to take it. But what I've done so far is sticking with the ISTH recommendation, even the others, 
it is not a contraindication. Having a VTE, even while you're on treatment, even in the acute phase of treatment, it is not contraindicated. So what you have to do is advise them, reassure them that there is no increment, both in terms of the VT associated, as I have said, from the few data coming out, the patient is having thrombophilia diagnosed or history or a, an, is, an incident acute VT on treatment. They are not seen to be having increased risk of uh, the vaccine associated VT. So they have to take it, that's a recommendation. And they don't need to discontinue any treatment, but they need to hydrate themselves, keep themselves active, and also on anticoagulant therapeutic doses, as I have said, if it is warfarin, you may need to check the INR, and if it is supratherapeutic, wait until it is below three, below four, and then get the vaccine before the next dose and apply a pressure on that side. So just to conclude, it is not a contraindication. It is recommended to those patients, both on anticoagulant, off anticoagulant, and history of uh, VTE. And I have done for most of my patients so far. Fortunately, I haven't seen any problem with that. But still, you will end up, your patients will take the advice and may not take that one. But the evidence is uh, in favor of uh, getting the vaccine. Yeah. Th thank you for that answer. I think we cannot stress enough for people not to be afraid of getting the vaccination as the benefits outweigh the risk. Effectively, yeah. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of questions, which tells me I think everybody is very interested in this subject and this topic. Uh, the last question I need to touch is there the duration of anticoagulation post COVID VTE is similar to the provoked VTE? Yes. Three months, that's a minimum of three months. After that, you know, we can evaluate the patient's condition for an ongoing risk of VT and the risk of bleeding, okay? So if they have multiple risk factors of uh, recurrent VT and they are at low risk of bleeding, you may extend. But the minimum is three months, like that of provoked VT. This is more or less consensus in most of the evidences. And from Addis Zeman Mogus, uh, his question, the use of aspirin in COVID patients, is there any use to it? Aspirin, again, like the recommendation is for those patients is already on aspirin for other indications, for cardiovascular indications, they have to continue. But for patients with COVID, be it having a mild disease or even moderate disease, and um, keeping or reserving an anticoagulant and using aspirin instead, there is no evidence so far. One of this uh, multi-continent platform is already an ongoing trial with the use of aspirin, as I have said, and starting. And to my knowledge, I haven't come across with any published data of that. So, so at this time, we don't have any recommendation to use aspirin solely for the reason of prevention of COVID-19 associated VT. But those patients already on an indication for an antiplatelet should continue in their stay. Excellent. I think there are some questions under the chat section, uh, Dr. Apok, if you can see some of them. I think most of the questions you have already answered them during the presentation. Uh, if any of the participants you have missed part of the presentation, which I highly recommend that you watch uh, all of it, it will be uploaded on our CME section on the YouTube channel, so you can watch it anytime. Um, but maybe Dr. Afro, if you see some of the questions, if they haven't been answered, I will, let, I will give you the opportunity to answer some of them. I'm muted. I'm trying to. Uh, no. Pick, oh, yeah. Were you pick, able to see uh, the chat section? Are you uh, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing them actually. Okay. Yeah. Like I think some, most of them you have already asked. Yeah. So I, I'm gonna, most of them yeah. Already yeah. I don't want to waste your time asking the same questions. Yeah. 
you can invite if there is someone who oh yes if anyone actually wants yeah. to speak, come let's up and speak, speak yeah. please let's, yes. let's do that way if you know that address. yeah so please raise your hand from the uh, participants uh you can come up to the stage so if i see a raised hand which at the bottom of your screen there are certain um uh, icons one of which is raise hand so if you raise your hand i will automatically or i will you know, uh, bring you up to be a panelist and ask you questions directly actually yes i see lydia um Dr. Afok, I think I made you a host, so you can bring up Lydia to speak up. I have. You can go ahead, uh, Lydia. Lydia? Oh. Um. I'm yes. sorry, my mic was mute, I guess. I can hear you now. Yeah, I can okay. hear you. Okay. I am practicing in Ikakutabi Hospital, and we have this practice of if the patient is initially in moderate COVID, we start with prophylactic dose. And then when the patient becomes critical, there is a practice of escalating the uh, heparin dose to therapeutic. and. Uh, is there any evidence to back up this practice? And what's your comment on this practice? Thank you, Lydia. Uh, in fact, I was just uh, referring indirectly to the practice that I've heard in your center. But I mean, if you follow the presentation and the data, it is rather, the data is going rather against the practice at your center. If you have to decide even such kind of anticoagulation, it should be the reverse from the data we have so far. I'm emphasizing on that. So that means you use the prophylactic dose, stick with the prophylactic dose, whatever critical, unless a patient is a terminal patient, ICU or mechanical ventilation. Or if you do, which I heard was that the case, which is you use a therapeutic dose at Yekakotabe for moderate patients. But now you're telling me that there's a prophylactic dose for uh, moderate patients, and then when they progress, that seems to be quite against the evidence. So there is no evidence for this practice. I would strongly suggest from what is available still to stick for all the patients, moderate, severe, critical illness, standard prophylactic dose of anticoagulation. If someone has to change, within his, an institution with the already available, it should be the reverse of what you've said. And that I'm not in favor of uh, doing. Actually, would have committed a protocol for St. Paul, and my suggestion was even prior to the publication of these data was still that prophylactic. So there is no evidence to start up with an incremental from moderate to severe. What exactly at this point, what we know is it is harmful or at least not beneficial for the critically ill patients. Maybe beneficial. In fact, it does appear to be as beneficial for the patients to use therapeutic anticoagulation, not the reverse one. And if it should await multiple clinical randomized trials and preferably approval by standard guideline now. Uh, revision and recommendations. So my recommendation is the last page, which I've said, still sticking for all the patients with a prophylactic dose of anticoagulation. Excellent. Uh, just, um, is there a way that, you know, like you have mentioned many times during your presentation, um, you know, COVID-19, we don't know so much about most of the things that's happening. It's an evolving data. Um, is there a way to communicate to update guidelines, you know, to, to the treatment centers that, for example, ACAP, so that, you know, they can update their guidelines? Or how often do we, do they need to update their guidelines, national guidelines, for example, so that, you know, there shouldn't be a discrepancy about how we manage patients? 
Very critical question. Uh, thank you for raising it. Probably, I mean, th this should be addressed. I don't know if there is anyone from uh, exposure or close acquaintances from the people in the local guideline development with the Ministry of Health. That would have been uh, the right person to answer this question. But we have so far at least what we have seen the published guideline from the national one. This is the third update which I presented, and it is grossly insufficient to guide the clinical practice and also it is not in line with the evolving data so we have three at least this is three update is quite a, a reasonable update in terms of uh, timing but there is not such a significant uh, recommendation change with the evolving data and some of the recommendations are in fact against the evidence so, so on my side uh, what I did last time was I presented in a couple of centers because I see the gap in uh, the practice. So the only way is to reach out the physician. So I have shared a lot of concerns like the questions raised here that they're very desperate when they see a rapidly deteriorating patient, they even go up into doubling the therapeutic dose. And um, so this is the, 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 the best opportunity to reach out the direct treating physicians. This is the best available data, and this is how we can impact the practice. So I've given this uh, talk to the Millennium uh, uh, Hospital, uh, Millennium uh, COVID Treating Center, and one of the private hospitals, and probably this is another good opportunity to reach out directly. And uh, I, I, I can say there is a, clear gap and someone has to address that. At least the local guideline is not in line with the evidences. Yeah, I don't know. You can also invite probably if there is anyone to address yeah. the question. Yeah. No, I, I see someone there, Beza Asafa, you, you, uh, if we can allow her to speak, I think she has a question. But in the meantime, if anyone from the attendees, you know, you are from one of the treating centers who have, you know, this, who have noticed a discrepancy in, the, in your guideline or in your clinical practice, you know. This but is probably, the point of sorry, sorry, sorry. But one important thing I forgot. Yeah. So starting in addition to going and uh, giving talks uh, with the evidences, as I've said, I have already organized uh, the evidence early, like uh, during March, and even prior to that, before the second edition of uh, the national protocol came out, I have personally submitted to those people who are organizing that, but uh, for some reason, it is not appearing. I actually re-communicated re with them. There is some uh, issues, gaps in terms of uh, incorporating all the interested data or whatever, but uh, from my side, this is a, the, the third edition, as I have told you, but. Uh, Prior to the second edition, I have presented quite different evidence, which is still persisting with the evolving evidence, but not incorporated in the guideline. From what I see, I, it rather seems actually it's cost effective not to do more for us in our setting. And for sure, I mean, very much cost effective, very much. And that's the right thing to do for our setup. That's what uh, I can say, yeah, very cost effective. Beza Asafa, would, would you like to say something? I see I have raised your hand. Dr. Afok, you can let her speak. Sorry, who is that, Beza? Beza Asafa, she's on the- uh, Okay. Part. Yeah, she's has raised her hand. Okay, she's yeah. allowed. She yeah. can go ahead, she can speak now. Go ahead, Beza. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Afok. I'm not sure if you remember or not, but uh, I was one of your students at uh, no St. Paul. Nice to meet you again. <laughs> yes, it was a pleasure to get to attend uh, one of your lectures again or one of your sessions. Um, my point is actually, this is very critical information because just two weeks back, I was admitting a patient to the ICU, not myself, but I had a family member who needed ICU support. So they didn't know whether they should give uh, the therapeutic or the uh, prophylactic also uh, there's a lot of uh, controversy here and what uh, I wanted to bring up was the fact that I'm currently working at the Ministry of Health under the COVID task force so I will take it up on myself as an assignment to actually talk to them about how we can get this information to all treating physicians in our country uh, I will call you and we will facilitate further because this is very important thank you 
Thank you very much, Beza. I mean, this is a very important. I mean, we have to just uh, do our best so that we can help the patients with the already existing data and also save uh, the cost of care. So with regard, as you've said, still there is, uh, the jury is still out in terms of uh, deciding the intensity of anticoagulation, both for the critically ill patient and the moderately ill patients. But the evidences that I have presented are in favor of using therapeutic dose now with the moderate patients. And it makes sense considering COVID is highly procoagulant inflammation thrombosis disease. So if they have to draw the maximum benefit, you have to get them at the early stage, not while they are in the mechanical ventilation. And mind you, these heparins are not uh, thrombolytic drugs. They are anticoagulants. So considering their rapid deterioration, unless we consider from clinical suspicion that this is a PE, as I have said, direct or indirect evidences, most of the time we cannot get the diagnostic confirmatory tests because of their condition. But if you have indirect means like using ECG bedside uh, Doppler, or if you do echocardiography or lower extremity DVT with VTs, these all are indications to escalate in a patient suspected of having PE to a therapeutic dose. In the absence of that, presenting with uh, critical illness or the what seems to be the usual deterioration of patients in the absence of any supportive evidence or high suspicion, at least clinically, we have to stick with the prophylactic anticoagulation. And that's what the evidence says. But still, the final verdict should come from the standard recommendations guidelines, and they are still awaiting for multiple high-quality evidences to come up. But for all the critical illnesses and the moderate, I think it is better to stay with that. And from my review of the data and the pattern of the background information, is, it looks like it's not going to change that much for those patients. Probably may change for the moderate patients with higher intensity of prophylaxis, but it awaits again multiple trials. So it is better to stick with standard prophylactic regimen for critical ICU patients for moderate patients. When we have a suspicion of clinical VT, be it lower extremity DVT or sudden respiratory deterioration or indirect evidence from ECG, ECHO or lower extremity DVT, go ahead with therapeutic. Other than that, I don't think that is a beneficial and probably maybe harmful for the critical patients. Thank you, Dr. Afor, and thank you, Beza. Um, this is actually one of the goals of uh, having this kind of webinars organized, apart from having the, you know, the uh, educational part, having the platform to connect uh, the speakers with other relevant uh, people in the ministry and other places is one of the, and I believe partly our goal is achieved and I hope this will uh, lead to some fruition of a change in how, in how we practice. Uh, there is one more question from Dr. Abraham Sisai. He says, I'm not sure if you have the data on this. How long after the development of vaccine in this thrombosis can a patient take another brand of vaccine? Would you recommend taking another? Sorry. Uh, very <laughs> tricky question. Okay. Well, well, sorry, the question can, can you... The question was, how long after having vaccine induced thrombosis can a patient take another brand of COVID vaccine? Or is it evident as recommended? Oh. That's a brilliant question. <laughs> I haven't thought before or I haven't come with uh, a literature suggesting that. It would be a difficult uh, even for the physician to consider giving. Well, well I, I don't think I'm, I'm able to answer this question. We need, <laughs> we need to. <laughs> yeah, this is very <laughs> rare event though, right? How yeah. <laughs> many cases of COVID-induced, COVID vaccine-induced thrombosis have we noticed? None so far. That, don't take this word because it, it may be a gross underestimation. Yeah. No, the history may not be corroborated well. A patient may come with such syndrome, but uh, no one may document that. But yeah. so far, practices, consultation from um, sample, other public setups, private practices, and the vaccine I've suggested in patients with all my VT patients have received, those uh, all their patients, I haven't 
so, so far come across with uh, such presentation. And I haven't seen any even uh, case reports from the national, any suspicion of such kind of uh, disease with the COVID vaccine. Okay. Um, is there anyone else who wants to raise hand and ask questions directly? Lydia, you still want, uh, I see a raised hand still. Uh, you still have more questions or? If not, I would like to Dr. Afford uh, give us a summary and uh, wrap up the session. And then we'll thank the uh, participant audience and then we'll close the session. Yeah, I think, I think, uh... I will not have uh, so much to say, but uh, I would like to thank you for giving me this uh, platform and uh, for meeting uh, colleagues and uh, important people who are working with Ministry of Health. And as you've already said, this is uh, again an evolving disease and an evolving data. So both the virus and the data coming at a pandemic rate. So we need to keep updated ourselves and uh, reach out to whatever uh, helpful professionals in this field in uh, times of uh, difficulty so that we can give the best care to our patients and uh, probably I would uh, reassure all the attendees here there will be one evidence-based and two they can uh, protect themselves they can present the evidence as what we have talked so the most important controversy of uh, anticoagulation prophylaxis should for now, should stay with the standard dose prophylaxis. I think that that's uh, what can I say finally. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Afo. This has been an excellent talk, and I myself has learned a lot. I was uh, attentively listening to Thank you. You, the data and everything, and it really, really, it was comprehensive and it covered all the topics. So I uh, will upload this later. So, you know, students, I see some medical students here, some practicing physician and residents here. So you can use it as, as a resource about, you know, how to manage your patients. Um, and at the same time, I think some of you uh, can get CU credit, continuing education unit credit from Emma for attending this webinar. I have been uh, sending the link to register on the chat section. So please register and you can use it. I have heard now license renewal and some other things need, you know, that you need to attend CU or need to continue uh, to have, you know, continuing medical education to, you know, approve your license. And actually it's not for license renewal as well. You just, you know, you need to engage, you need to continue to learn. And if you want to get the credits, please make sure that you register and get the point. And we always trying to bring important lectures, topics, and expert speakers to this webinar. Um, so wh whatever you saw today, if you want us to improve in how we present and how we do this webinar, please give us a comment. Uh, you can find us on our Twitter, uh, Facebook, or Telegram channels. We actually want to do it better. So your comments and uh, suggestions will make us do this better. And I, I again thank Dr. Afford. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I hope we'll continue to work together in other areas as well. So I'll be closing this session. And I also want to thank Ethiopian Medical Association and Ethiopian Medical Students Association who have been very helpful in organizing this webinar. We'll be working with them um, in the coming months as well. So stay tuned and thank you everyone again. Thank you, Dr. Afford. Thank you, I thank you everyone. Thank you. You can close uh, from your side since I need you the most. Stop the recording and then close it.